And it helps us to understand our relationship with God, particularly through the eyes of Moses, no matter how fickle that relationship can be, at least on our side of the equation. As we jump into this text, which is going to be found on page 73 in your pew Bibles, in case you're wondering, I want you to know that God has heard the cry of his people, that he's delivered them from the hand of Pharaoh by his prophet Moses, that he's brought them through the wilderness, they've arrived to the mountain of God, Mount Sinai, Moses has received the law, they are so frightened of God's presence at this moment that they even say, don't even let the Lord talk to us. Don't let him speak to us. We'll listen to you, Moses. And while Moses is receiving the law and he's hearing even about how God is going to imbue Bezalel and Aholiab with his Holy Spirit, pouring it out on them so that they might be able to work with their hands, all of these fancy things for the tabernacle, the very dwelling place of God, at the foot of the mountain, the people rose up to play, and they're creating this idol, the golden calf. They're sinning against God. They're breaking the very first commandment. And it's in the middle of that scene that we have this discussion between Moses and the Lord. Exodus chapter 33, beginning in verse 12. And Moses said to the Lord, See, you say to me, bring up this people. But you have not let me know whom you will send with me. Yet you have even said, I know you by name, and you have also found favor in my sight. Now, therefore, if I have found favor in your sight, please show me now your ways that I may know you in order to find favor in your sight. Also consider that this nation is your people. And God said, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. And Moses said to the Lord, if your presence will not go with me, do not bring us up from here. For how shall it be known that I have found favor in your sight, I and your people? Is it not in your going with us? So that we are distinct, I and your people, from every other people, on the face of the earth. Really listen to what's being said for a moment. Meditate on the scripture. Martin Lloyd-Jones once said that this moment between the Lord and Moses is the pinnacle of spiritual understanding. Because hear what God is saying. God is saying, look, you guys are a stiff-necked people. If I hang out with you anymore, I'm just going to consume you in a moment. You go up. I promise you the land of Canaan. It's a land flowing book and honey. It's blessed. There are houses there that you haven't built. There's vineyards that you haven't grown. You go up. You go by yourself. I'll send an angel with you. And Moses said, we don't want to go up there unless you're with us. Unless you go with us. What he realized was that no matter what we have, in this world, and a lot of us have a lot of things, it is of no value. Canaan is of no value if God is not with us. And this cry, this desire for God's presence, his real presence to be with us, his people, has rung through the ages. I want you to hear the voice of the prophets as we just survey scripture beginning with Psalm 27 in verse 4. One thing I have asked of the Lord, that I will seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. You hear David after his sin with Bathsheba saying in Psalm 51, beginning in verse 11, Cast me not away from your presence, and take not your Holy Spirit away from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. Uphold me with a willing spirit. You have Psalm 84, beginning in verse 1. How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord of hosts. My soul longs, yes, faints for the courts of the Lord. My heart and flesh sing for joy to the living God. For a day in your courts is better than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell 
in the tents of wickedness. We're going to pray here in a moment, but I want you to take a moment just to meditate and to examine yourself. We have plenty of time, but I want you guys to give yourself permission to allow this to fall upon your hearts. While you're sitting there meditating, I want you to allow your focus to drift from what I'm saying to how you feel in this moment. Do you feel joyful? Do you feel at rest and peaceful? Do you feel anxious? Pay attention to how you feel right in this moment. Do you feel, do you feel sad? Are you filled with bitterness? Are you angry? However you feel, begin to ask yourself the question, why do I feel that way? Is it because of something really hard that you're walking through right now? Maybe it's a regret from this past week that you had. As you wrestle with those feelings, I want you to ask God, as you bow your heads, go ahead, bow your heads with me. I want you to ask God in his mercy to reveal to you anything in your heart that offends him or causes him displeasure. Oh God, oh God of Jacob, be our strength. Teach us to want you, oh God. Teach us to desire your holy presence. We as your people know that we are to long for your presence to be with us, to sing truthfully and honestly, asking that you would be with us. But sometimes, Father, we grow so weary in our waiting. Sometimes in our waiting, we lose meaning. Sometimes we get lost along the way and we feel like we lack purpose. We question our beliefs, our convictions. Sometimes we feel like we're only hanging on by threads. Father, teach us to believe that it is in you that we live and move and have our being. Father, move our hearts to grow closer to you. Help us to learn wherein we have walked away. Help us to ask, how did we get to this point? Help us to retrace our steps, to look for the old paths where the good way is. Father, help us to hear your voice in the Holy Scriptures. Move our hearts to want you, Father. For all is in vain and all is for naught if you do not go with us. In the name of Christ we pray, and amen. You would open up your Bibles to John chapter 1.
in creation, we see Adam and Eve had some sense of God's presence in the garden. We see it in, in little moments in time with Enoch and Noah and Abraham. And um, you know, there were manifestations of God's presence in the tabernacle and the temple. And, and then you think about just that, that cry, though. Dave, David, uh, in, in the, the Psalms that, that Tyler read, you know, got it, got what it was about, longing for God, longing for his presence. And, and as Tyler said, that cry just echoed through the ages. God, will you come? Will you, will you be with us? Let's, let, let, let's know you and, and experience you, be with you, be with us. And so we come to John's gospel, and it begins in the beginning. And John knew exactly what he was doing when he opened up the, the, his gospel with the words, in the beginning, because where, does, where do those words take us back to? Genesis, right? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. The Word was God. All things came into being through Him, and apart from Him, nothing came into being that has come into being. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. See what's being said about this one known as the Word, right? with God in the beginning, in the, in the very presence of God, in the close personal fellowship with God. And then look at what's said down in verse 14. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, glory of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. Think about what that's saying. Here's God, right? the word. He became flesh, like us. He took on our experience of weakness and sickness and hunger and, and, and entered into the, 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 the world with all its evils that, were, that are heaping up. He took on that experience and dwelt among us. That, that word dwelt there is tabernacled. He tabernacled among us. And what does that draw our minds to, right? All those manifestations of God when his presence was in the tabernacle and his presence was in the temple and, and Isaiah saw him and Ezekiel saw just the, the appearance of the likeness of the glory of God. But no, no, the word became flesh and dwelt among us, tabernacled among us. Look what John says, we beheld his glory. But when the glory of God is shown in the person of Jesus, it looks a lot different than it did to Abraham when he saw that burning pot or to, to, to Moses and the people of Israel when the fire, the glory of the Lord filled the, the tabernacle or when Solomon prayed and again, fire filled the, the temple, right? How is the glory of God manifested? Well, the first time we see it is in John 2. At the end of, of that chapter where there's this wedding feast in Cana and Jesus turned the water into wine and, and, and drew on all that imagery and the prophets of the new wine that would flow in the, in the age to come. And, and he says we saw his glory. And there's different points throughout John's gospel that we see his glory. But the, the greatest manifestation is the cross. There he's glorified. There he's exalted. And so as we look at Jesus, this word became flesh who dwelt among us, who gave us, who came to us, whose presence was among us. We see his glory in his living, in his teaching, in his healing, in him giving himself. And then if, you'll, if you're in John 1, look at verse 18. No one's seen God at any time. No one's seen God at any time. Think about that statement for just a second. We've just re recounted several experiences of God's presence. Right? Again, the, the pillar of cloud, the pillar of fire. Um, even in, in Exodus 19, when the, they go up to the mountain and they see the sapphire and all this sort of stuff, it says they saw God. 
Uh, Moses said, let me see you, and he puts him in the, the cleft of the rock and passes by, so he sees his backside. You think about the, the vision of Isaiah in Isaiah 6, uh, the holiness of God, the, the seraphim flying around him, or again, Ezekiel that I referenced a moment ago where he sees this great throne chariot with the, the, the cherubim around him, and it is just described as the appearance of the likeness of the glory of God. All, again, all these incredible displays of God's presence and power and glory Yet John is so bold to say, no one's seen God at any time. But then look at what he says next. The only begotten Son of God, who's in the bosom of the Father, he has explained him. So what we see when we see Jesus then, we see his true Son, who is in the closest personal fellowship with him, in the bosom of the Father. He's explained him. He's revealed him. And so later on, just before Jesus' death in John 14, and, and Philip says, show us the Father. What does Jesus say? Philip, I've been with you this whole time. And how do you say, show us the Father? You've seen me. You see the Father. Let this sink in for just a second. I mean, think about how profound this is, right? The glory of God, the holiness of God, yet how is he seen and how is he known? When the word became like us. And dwelt among us. We held his glory. The glory was the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. Let's pray. Our Father... Teach us to see you in Jesus, in his profound humility, in his compassion, in his powerful teaching, <clears throat> in all the signs that he performed. Each sign says something about who you are and what you're doing, and what you will do, our hope in you. Help us to see you in kindness and compassion he showed towards others, the patience that he had with his disciples, and their weakness, and their failures, and their just the, the times that they were so focused on the wrong things. Help us to see you in the way that he was bold and strong and stood up for what was right and what was just and he would not give an inch to the corruption and the religious leaders. And yet he was so full of, of grace for those who were lost, for those who were heartbroken and sorrowful and understood the weight of their sin. When the sinful woman came to him and tried to anoint his feet and wept all over him and was embarrassing and woke, w wiped his feet with her hair, he was full of grace and compassion and commended her, gave her the assurance of forgiveness, proclaimed how great her love was. When Cornelius, or when, when the centurion sent about healing his servant, and the servant responded with humility, or and the centurion responded with humility and with, with, with faith, Jesus was in awe and marveled. Throughout his life, we see, again, compassion and love and mercy and grace and patience and so many good things that help us to know you and above all when he gave himself to die for our sins help us to see you in his death to see love to see justice to see your holiness to see humility to see the way you ache with us in our sin, in our, our world ruled by evil. 
so much so that you would enter in to our experience and walk with us and raise us up out of it. Father, you are worthy of all praise, honor, and glory, and power, and dominion. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. If you would open up your Bibles to 1 John. John's writings just fit together so, so well. Um, read John and then read 1 John. Read 1 John and then read John. And just you'll see those two, two pieces of scripture just helping us so, so much. 1 John is so profound in so many ways. Um, there are many themes that John weaves together and, and just layers in throughout this rich letter. By far the most profound is what he says about love. For John, love is at the very center of everything for, for us, right? It's God is love. And if we are children of God, we're defined by love as well. He tells us in, in chapter 3, we know love by this, that he laid down his life for us. And then he goes on to say, we also ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. See what he's saying there? We learn love, we see love, we come to know love when we experience Jesus at the cross. And that should so shape us and move us and change us that we would go so far as to do the same for one another. Hear that for just a second. We'll greet each other, say hello, how's it going, have each other over... over have each other over for dinner and things like that. But lay down your life for one another. See what seeing God and seeing love at the cross is supposed to be doing in us. And then he says in verse 17, if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need and closes his heart against him, how does the love of God abide in him? Right? We, we don't have the opportunity to lay down our lives for each other every day. But we see needs and we see hurts. How do we respond to those needs and those hurts? If we have the ability, do we respond and help? Or do we close our hearts? And he says, if we close our hearts, is God's love really in us? And then he says, little children, let us not love with word and tongue. Saying I love you and talking about love and gathering around the table and saying love, love, love. But with deed and truth. Let's, let's imitate the cross. Let's embody the cross. And then a little bit later in chapter 4, he, he uh, again calls us to love. Let's love one another. Love is of God. Everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. For God is love. But look at verse 12. And this is, this is, to me, one of the most profound verses in, in Scripture. When I, when I first came across this and learned what, what it was saying. It was one of those, right, where your just head explodes when you really think about what's being said here. He says, no one's seen God at any time. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. Now think about that for just a second. How did he begin that line? No one has seen God at any time. Does that remind you of something? Where did we just hear that? In John 1, right? What was said about Jesus. No one's seen God at any time. The only begotten Son of God who's from the in the bosom of the Father, He has explained Him, right? The point was, you look at Jesus and see God. Jesus reveals God. You see, you, you see God and come to know God when you look at Jesus. Now look at what John's saying here. No one's seen God at any time. If we love one another, God abides in us. And his love is perfected in us. And that word perfected there, telos, has, has, it talks, it, 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 it is the idea of something has reached its end, its aim, its goal. Right. What love was aiming at. And just a few verses earlier, he talked about, okay, we, that, that love was manifested to us. 
at the cross when God gave his son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sin, right? So, so, so we certainly recognize, all right, when our sins are forgiven and Jesus dealt with our sin on the cross, all right, that's God's love being manifested to us. But just forgiving our sins wasn't the aim, wasn't the end of that love. The end of that love was that that act of grace and mercy and love would so shape us and transform us that it would be seen in us, then God's love has reached its end and its aim. When we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. Now, take this all the way back to the beginning. Right? Fire comes down from heaven and fills the tabernacle and there's God's presence. And Moses is crying out, God, if you don't go with us, there's no point in us going. And, and David says, one thing I've asked from the Lord, that shall I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And then when he's beset with sin, don't take away your Holy Spirit from us. And in Psalm 84, one day in your court, that longing for God's presence. And then we see it in Jesus, but then it doesn't stop there. It's supposed to be in us. In our relationships with one another. In the ways we love one another and treat one another. And so... As we can look at Jesus and see God, the world is supposed to look at us and see God. We're supposed to be in this family and see God, experience God and know God. No one's seen God at any time. If we love one another, and not just say we love one another, but if we love one another, God abides in us. Love is perfected in us. Isn't that right? That's incredible that he would bestow that gift, that great opportunity, that great responsibility on us. Let's pray. Father, we long for you in all your fullness and your presence. We long to see you face to face, be close to you. God of holiness and power and glory and love. And yet we hear the words of your scriptures. We hear the words of your servant, John. We come to recognize that you can be seen in us when we love each other. When our lives and our relationships are, are characterized by giving and caring and helping one another, serving one another, being humble before one another. Be seen in us, O oh God. May everyone here come to see you and know you and experience you in the fullest in, 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 in greater fullness through this church. May the world, the, the, the people that that um, we interact with in in our communities, in our places of work, in our other friends and family, may they come to to see you and, and know you um, through us. Not just warm smiles on a Sunday morning, but through having each other's backs and through truly caring about one another and being there for one another and giving of ourselves for each other. Father, may your love be, take, take deep root inside us. Drive out all selfishness, drive out all pride. May we put on true humility and giving. Father, you are amazing in your glory, in your wisdom. Your heart is incredibly wonderful. We long to see you and know you and be close to you. May we glorify you together in our unity and in our love. 
In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen.